to Developmental Psychology Unit 2. This unit is perhaps our longest unit of the entire semester, and that's because we're covering everything that happens before birth. That is our genetic development as well as our prenatal development. Now, a lot of this unit might be review or it might be brand new. There tends to be a lot of individual variants with this, but it does allow us to have a good chance to sort of catch up and get on the same page. So what you can see, this is our map we're going to move through, and we're going to start with genetics, then move into pregnancy, the birthing process, and then very, very early neonatal care. So let's get to it. Now, this is not a genetics course, and so we're really just talking about genetics as developmental psychologists tend to refer to them. So this is not reflective of the larger discipline of biogenetics. But in developmental psychology, we do attend to genetic diversity, and we do have to look at some types of genetic mapping. For instance, we are interested in karyotypes, and karyotypes are the map of our chromosomes. Now, most humans will have 46 chromosomes in each of their cells in their body, with the exceptions being sperm cells and ovum cells. You might know ovum as more commonly referred to as the egg cell. In both the sperm and the ovum, what you'll find is actually 23 chromosomes. Only half of the possible chromosomes make it into these specialized cells. It's important to stress that the 23 chromosomes that make it into each sperm or each ovum are not going to be the 23 chromosomes you receive from one parent or the other. That is, your chromosomes in these specialized cells are not going to be replicas of the grandparents who gave them to you. It's going to be a lot more complicated than that. The way the cellular processes work is that it can actually lead to infinite combinations of the types of chromosomes that can be in each ovum or sperm. That means there could be infinite possibilities for the genome in the next generation. And so what you can see here is I have laid out the 23 pairs, or sometimes called the 22 pairs, plus the sex chromosomes. The sex chromosomes are the only ones in this karyotype that don't look like they match in terms of the length of the chromosome. And you may see them down there, they're in the third row, and the last one on the right, they're in gray. And you can see that one looks long, one looks short. And that's because the short one tends to be known as the Y chromosome, and the long one tends to be known as the X chromosome. And in individuals who have one X and one Y, they typically develop into males. Now, on each of these chromosomes, you're going to see different bands and different colors. And it's important to stress that these bands or colors is what actually programs our traits. Now, depending on which combination of chromosomes you get, this is going to lead to different physical and psychological traits. And it can be a bit like winning the lottery. So how do these traits work? Well, we talk about traits and alleles in the same in developmental psychology. So when we talk about those bands on the chromosome, those are alleles, and we sometimes refer to them as traits. Now, how do they work? Well, they refer to our genotype. That is, you have two chromosomes in each pair, and on each one of those chromosomes in a pair, they're gonna be coding for the same traits, but they may not code for them in the exact same way. So what might happen here is on one chromosome, you might have the allele or the trait for curly hair, but on the corresponding chromosome, on the corresponding allele, you might actually have the trait for straight hair. It's quite possible that you might have them where they're both for curly hair or both for straight hair, and if the two alleles match, that is considered to be homozygous. That means if you have two traits that cover the same eye color or the same type of attached or detached earlobes, that's going to be homozygous. They're matching. But if they're different, if you have one allele for curly, one allele for straight, uh, this is going to be called heterozygous. And that's because you have two traits that are different. Hetero means different, homo means same. So if they match, they're homozygous. If they're different, they're heterozygous. Now, the genotype is just exactly what is there at the molecular level. If we were to look in the research lab and actually detect it through a DNA test, we'd be able to determine your genotype. But through looking at your DNA, we can't always guess what's going to be your phenotype. And your phenotype is how these codes manifest on your person, how they actually show up. You may have one code for curly hair, one code for straight hair, but maybe you don't have either. Maybe you have wavy hair, and your wavy hair would be your phenotype. So genotype is how the codes actually show up under the microscope, and phenotype is how they actually show up visible to others and visible to you in the mirror. Now, what would happen if you have heterozygous traits? How do we determine which one of those will actually influence your phenotype the most? Well, in order to understand that, we have to talk about dominance. So dominance refers to, at the molecular, at the chemical level, which alleles are more potent and have a stronger influence on the phenotype. 
For instance, we know that some alleles are just always going to be more influential on the phenotype. They just seem to be chemically more potent. And some common examples of these would be things like freckles, something I know a lot about. It could also be curly hair. If you have one allele for curly hair, one allele for straight hair, you will more often than not at least have some curl to your hair. We also know other dominant alleles are things like dark hair, dark eyes, also a dark skin complexion, being able to roll your tongue like this, also things like detached earlobes. By a detached earlobe, we're talking about an earlobe that sort of dangles and, and hangs away from the head a little bit. And so these are examples of dominant traits. We also have recessive traits. Recessive traits are the alleles that are just less potent. They're less likely to influence the phenotype if they're being compared to something else. You can certainly still have recessive traits influence your phenotype, but it especially happens when you have two of them. So if you have two codes for straight hair, you're more often than not going to have straight hair. If you have two codes for light hair or light skin or light colored eyes, you're more likely going to have those things appear in your phenotype. And attached earlobes are the types of earlobes that don't really dangle, they just kind of curve down and go right into your head. So they don't have much of a dangle to them. And so those are examples of recessive traits. Now there's more to human diversity than just dominant or recessive traits. We also know there can be this fascinating phenomenon known as incomplete dominance. Incomplete dominance is when your genotype, your alleles are heterozygous in a blended way. And so by blended, what we mean is in every cell in the body, both of them influence your phenotype. And so you can think about mixing colors with this. If somebody was heterozygous for their skin complexion, one parent had a very dark complexion, one parent had a very light or fair complexion, they may have a medium skin tone. Another example would be hazel eyes. Hazel eyes seem to be that combination of green and brown eyes, but it's not really green, it's not really brown. And in every cell in the iris of the eyes, it's that mixed color. And so that is going to represent a hazel color and its incomplete dominance. Another example I already mentioned is wavy hair. Perhaps with one parent providing the allele for curly, one parent providing the allele for straight hair, you're not going to have either straight or curly, but somewhere in the middle, and it's going to be more wavy hair. We can see incomplete dominance in non-human species as well. If you were mixing flowers and there was a red flower versus a white flower and the offspring were pink, for instance, and in every cell in the petals, it was neither red nor white, but was pink. Sometimes both alleles can influence the phenotype, but in a non-blended way. And this is referred to as codominance. What's happening here in codominance is when you look at the cellular level, in some cells, one allele is dominant, and in other cells, the other allele is dominant. So this may be portrayed by an individual who has two different eye colors. Perhaps in their left eye, they have brown eyes, and in their right eye, they have blue eyes or perhaps they have brown hair in some parts of their head, but then they also have red hair, maybe particularly in their beard, for instance, they might have red hair in their beard. You may have some individuals that have one attached to your lobe and one dangling ear lobe. There could be many examples of this. We can also find this in non-human species. For instance, if we had a flower that had one red parent and one white parent, and the offspring was not pink, but some petals were red and some petals were white, and both alleles were influencing the phenotype in a non-blended way. So incomplete dominance is something where there's a mixing and a blending of colors, and it's like a happy medium, versus a codominance is when there's no mixing, but both influence just in different parts of the body.